Okay. Well, hi everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to our fourth webinar of the Food Systems Leadership Network series on demystifying the supply chain. My name is Ellie Baumstein, and I work at the Wallace Center, and I'm calling in from Washington, D.C. Uh, first off, I want to thank everyone for taking the time to be here. I know there's a lot of upheaval and chaos and just sort of general exhaust exhaustion these days, so I really appreciate your time. Um, and I'm inviting everyone, if you can, to turn off distractions. Maybe if you have a news alert, maybe you don't <laughs> be looking at that for the next 75 minutes so we can all just focus and learn from each other and from our excellent presenters um, who are ready to share a lot of knowledge with us today. Um, so please stay muted to minimize background noise. If you have questions as they occur to you, put them in the chat box and we'll get to them at the end of the call. We'll have plenty of time um, to get those questions answered. So this call is brought to you by the Food Systems Leadership Network, which is a national peer, peer learning community that connects current and emerging leaders, strengthens individual and collective leadership capacity and fosters collaboration across communities. The goal of the network is to accelerate the realization of a just, equitable, and sustainable food system that generates good food, health, and opportunity for all. We recently launched a new online platform, which is a place to access all of the resources, many calls like this one that we've recorded over the years, um, and also offers lots of really exciting ways to interact with your peers. So feel free to check that out after the call at foodsystemsleadershipnetwork.org. And I'll put that link. Oh, Elizabeth, my coworker already got me. Um, so as I mentioned, this is the last in a series on how the local food supply chain works. Our goal is to help all of us feel more confident about how local food gets from farm to fork, who the players in between are, and what their incentives are, how those folks make decisions. Uh, we're hoping to help increase your technical understanding of these systems. Well, understanding of these systems and how you, oh, how you, hang on, uh, and how you can affect them uh, and optimize them for farmers and small businesses in your community. Um, we've had three previous calls, which focused first on understanding how demand shapes the supply chain, then translating the specifics of that demand through to the producers, and the uh, most recent one was about the role of the food hub. And I'll send out the links to all of those calls um, in the recording to this call so you can go back and watch them or watch them again. So we're going to land this four part plane today by talking about the ever important role of value chain coordination. Though the players in the supply chain, the ones sort of doing the buying and selling are obviously critical and make a lot of decisions about these systems. There's also other folks that may not be directly in the chain that have a big impact and um, you know, can really influence what that chain looks like. Wow. So today we're going to be hearing from What's up? those kinds of folks. Right. Um, <laughs> and uh, learning about the roles of value chain coordination and how people that aren't doing the buying and selling can um, still have an impact and help influence those supply chains. Um, it's going to be a panel style conversation today that will hopefully get us a better understanding of the levers that you can pull um, to influence how the supply chain works. And yeah, feel free to add questions as they occur to you. And I'm gonna let our presenters introduce themselves. Um, today we'll be hearing from Kendall Chavez from the New Mexico Department of Public Education and Olivia Vogel and Alita Botts from the Kentucky Center for Agriculture and Rural Development. So Kendall, why don't you introduce us or introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your work. Mm -hmm. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kendall Chavez. I am the Farm to School Healthy Schools Coordinator for the Public Education Department here in New Mexico and based in Santa Fe. And we serve about 216 school food authorities across the state, um, tribal, charter, public, parochial, and more. Um, and my role is to really build out the backbone infrastructure for our farm to school program, which we'll get to later, um, and really develop a system that doesn't exist, right? So build the system that best supports our farmers and our producers and our buyers to best and most seamlessly purchase beautiful local produce for our school meal program. So that's a little bit about me. Prior to coming to the state, I worked in the nonprofit world for about a decade. So. Pass it back to you, Ellie. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Kendall. Um, so Olivia and Alita, if you want to introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about the Kentucky Center for Agriculture and Rural Development, or KCARD. Sure. Thanks so much for having us. Um, Alita Botts, I'm the Executive Director for the Kentucky Center for Agriculture and Rural Development, KCARD. We're an 11-person or a nonprofit organization that works statewide in Kentucky. Um, uh, primarily providing technical assistance and educational opportunities for agricultural producers, agribusinesses, 
and agricultural projects defined pretty broadly to include um, local food work, um, provided that it's tied to benefit to Kentucky farmers. Um, and so we've been involved, uh, most of our work is business planning and financial planning oriented, uh, but we also help with marketing plans, feasibility analysis, and helping people find available loan and grant money. Um, our work on the value chain, um, you know, we used to do it sort of ad hoc to the business planning work that we were doing because we work with between 150 to 200 producers every month. Um, and so we have a lot of reach uh, with both producers, processors, and others in the, in the value chain. And just in the past year, we took a different tact. We were asked to take a different tact to really focus more intentionally on that as a major service of KCARD. And so with that, I'll pitch it to Olivia, who um, transitioned from a role providing business development services at KCARD to coordinating our local, uh, local food work. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Olivia Vogel, and I'm our local food project coordinator here at KCARD. And so my role is, um, it fits in with KCARD's mission, but it's a little bit different. And I work primarily with um, producers and with buyers, um, developing those relationships and trying to make appropriate matches, doing a little bit of soft pushing uh, on, in, you know, institutions or chefs, K through 12, retail, um, I also do some targeted market outreach based on like farmer interest. Um, so for example, I had a guy that had like mal malted barley he was working with. So reached out to bakeries um, specifically, you know, for um, his interest. But that's a little bit about my role. Um, the other major thing I would mention is that we also help producers get connected to the resources that they need, such as um, if they need to pursue a gap audit or if they need a nutritional label. We are working with a dairy producer who had an opportunity from like a major retailer um, getting the, those guys, um, men and women connected up with the folks that can assist them take that next step. So that's a little bit about it. Wonderful. Thank you guys. Um, so my first question for you today, and I'll ask it, and if you have a great response, you can pipe up or I'll call on one of y'all, um, is just how did you learn about the supply chain where you work? What are the key questions that you asked to get the lay of the land? Who are some folks that you called? How did you figure out what's going on? So, oh, Olivia, did you want to go? No, go ahead. Kim. Okay. Um, the awkward Zoom, Zoom room. Um, so, I, yeah, and I want to mention a little bit more about sort of the structure of our program. And this will, this is sort of the pathway or our vehicle for really understanding the supply chain here in our state. Um, so, so in the farm to school program that I manage out of our education department, we're sort of the umbrella or the container for all of our work is this idea and this brand of New Mexico grown. We've had state legislative money for almost a decade. Um, and so this, this container, right, for many state agencies and for local agencies and other sort of governmental agencies, the traditional role of somebody like me would be just to manage flow through funds and just like to manage the program, making sure that we're connecting buyers to growers and that's it, right? And those of us that do this work know that it's so much more, you can give a district $100,000, but if they don't have a farmer and they don't have those connections and capacity and the technical assistance and the resources to make the relationship fruitful, then we're sort of missing the point. So um, our work over the last decade, my work over the last two and a half years is to really shift this idea of like the traditional role of government to something that's much more innovative and um, participatory. So our role of like figuring out where the gaps are and needs are comes from being sort of like the backbone, um, you know, the question about role. My role is really to be like the head st strategist, consultant, connector, and sort of infrastructure builder on the backside that lets the front side of the work, the actual buyers and producers really do their work to, to their fullest capacity, right? So, um, and that's like the beauty and the power of government and sort of, I hope the future that many other agencies will kind of see their role as. Um, so over the last decade, we noticed, you know, we're just looking at where the gaps are. And I think in New Mexico, what makes our work kind of interesting, and maybe this is true of other states, is the policy work came far ahead of the actual programmatic and the system work. And so there's cons and pros to that, right? There's some beautiful things that came out of it, but it mostly was us spinning our wheels for the last 78 years, backfilling the capacity needed to really execute state legislative initiatives um, through our agency. So you know, we kind of observed and absorbed all the things that were working and asked some questions. And I think the major thing um, for, for me and for my colleagues to really understand the lay of the land um, was to really look at the producers and who was selling into the farm to school system. Um, 
And the other piece for context that I forgot to mention, I'm a little bit circular today, so sorry about that. Um, is that the Edison program, the container um, has historically been for schools, but literally in this moment, our administrative advocacy, our external advocates that are working with the state legislature and our coalition of partners um, are adapting the NM Grown program for schools to also include early care and seniors. So we're kind of opening up this umbrella to include multiple age, multiple touch points or multiple sectors for farmers to sell into based on their on their capacity and need. So, um, you know, the first question was like, again, who's selling to schools? Because that was the data that we had at the time. Um, we, we, we noticed that the farmers weren't really changing or the vendors weren't really changing. We're increasing in number, we weren't increasing in diversity, we weren't um, decreasing in age, we weren't decreasing in the size of our farms, we weren't increasing in the presence of farmers who don't speak English as their first language. And so that was the first major sort of aha and also noticing or sort of, you know, really keeping in mind that in New Mexico, and this may be true of other states, 95% um, of our growers are not GAP or third party certified. We really, the backbone and the infrastructure of our program is really hyper local, super small traditional farmers that have been growing food on their land for thousands of years, right? So it's a little bit of a different um, context. Um, so we really recognized that and also noticed that, you know, like our, our aggregation was a major issue in, in various parts of the state, specifically in our rural parts of the state who didn't have the infrastructure of the, for us, the Rio Grande corridor or the more urban parts of the state that had nonprofits and, and extra resources, human capacity to kind of make these dreams a reality. And so really focusing, um, on those gaps in the system as we sort of um, delved into future policy work, but also developing the farm to school system that now informs senior centers and early care. So I'll stop there because I'll just keep rambling. No, that was great. I love the idea of, you know, starting with the growers and trying to understand the sort of patterns and, and uh, signals that that group of growers is sending you. Um, so Olivia and Alita, how did you all, you know, how would you suggest people get started? How did you all start understanding the local food uh, picture in Kentucky? Yeah, um, I'm actually going to, I'm going to talk about that first, but um, I'm going to tag on to what Kendall um, said I, it's a very similar point so um, it's encouraging to hear about that going on in other parts of the country but um, so KCARD we learned about the supply chain um, kind of at the ground level you heard some examples that Alita gave of um, different folks that we've worked with for a long time so we've worked with meat meat processors on their business development or business plans we've got those connections um, with co-packers distributors um, so that was, I was really fortunate to, to walk into all of those relationships, kind of already at, at least the baseline level um, with this position, like adding that, that on to our organization. Um, and then also we, we work with a lot of partnerships. So, you know, the, the Department of Ag, we work closely with them, horticulture, um, organic associations, et cetera. Um, and I've tried to learn as much as I can from all of the different um, local food initiatives or efforts that have gone on throughout the state. Um, there's been some other local food coordinators. Some of them are still working in that role. Um, some got cut um, just due to city budgets, just in different ways. So I've tried to learn from that work that's gone on um, before me. And then, so some of the key questions um, I have tried to ask what does production in Kentucky give me to work with for local food? So what is our strength? Um, and maybe where are our weaknesses? And um, so as an example, um, Alita and I were kind of talking in preparation for this call. We, we kind of get a little bit tired of this saying, but since it's, uh, at Kentuckians get a little tired of this saying, but since it's a national call, it might be new news. Um, Kentucky is the largest cattle producer east of the Mississippi. Um, so we have a ton of beef cattle in our state and it's not really for the local food scene. It's more cow-calf um, backgrounding operations, but it's still an asset in our state. And we have to recognize that for the local food movement. Um, and just an example, like the, the Cattlemen's Association is starting to like dip their toes in the local food movement, which I think is, is really saying something, you know, they're not wanting to pass up that opportunity. And um, so just in, an example of a response to this opportunity in our state, um, especially with COVID this last year and the increased interest in local meat purchasing, um, we decided to offer a webinar series, which seems like the most we can do these days <laughs> from uh, no in-person meetings. But just as an example, we, we focused on production processing and sales. So 
um, we had a meat processor talk about to beginning farmers about what they might need to know. And we, we brought in a chef. Um, we have an institution in Lexington that does whole carcass purchasing for finished beef. And so they were able to speak, some direct to consumer um, sellers were able to speak. So um, anyway, just trying to play on our strengths and um, bring that to the local food opportunities in our state is um, a question that I've tried to ask. And then um, the other thing I had noted was where are the easy wins and then where is the worthy but is going to take some time opportunities and um, working on both, not just one or the other, but kind of cl clearly saying from the onset so that I don't get discouraged like, okay, this is going to take some time, but it's worthy and I need to also have a small win this week. So I'm going to make this phone call or something. I think that's a good lesson for all of us. <laughs> But I like this idea that both of you brought up about, um, you know, understanding what your assets are in addition to the deficits, because I think every state, you know, Olivia mentioned um, some local food coordinators, so maybe some other human capital that was already in the system. And Kendall was talking about the sort of policy wins that had been established that they were kind of trying to backfill. So I think that understanding the assets feels really important. Alita, did you want to add anything or should we move on? I think she summed it up well. The only thing I might add is that, you know, learning about the supply chain for us is a little bit different um, than some organizations just because we've been working in it for 19 years at this point. And so, you know, we've, we've worked with so many of the entities and, and all of the work that we do on supply chain is really grounded on business development. We're not going to try to get people to do things that aren't going to be good for their business. And producers really trust us to, to advise them in that way. So I think that's really helped us with navigating the supply chain. Credibility. Um, so as you know, maybe let's say you've established your understanding, you kind of get the, the sense of who the players are. Um, what are the tools that you have in your tool belt to influence the supply chain, um, particularly with an eye to how you might make it more accessible to marginalized producers? I can go first, Kindle this time. <laughs> um, so I, I think uh, a really important aspect of KCARD structure is that we, we are a nonprofit and um, we're, that has its benefits. And um, so we can um, try to ensure equal access to both uh, our services and opportunities, but also to market opportunities. Um, we especially try to make them more accessible to limited resource producers in, in many different capacities. I mean that limited resources in many different ways. Um, and we specifically try to work with them where they're at. So Kendall mentioned that not many folks in, in her state are gap audited and that's true here as well. And so I can't necessarily make um, maybe institutional or like big change goals that I might have, I can't put that on a producer or on several producers in my state who aren't at that level or maybe that's never their goal. Um, so trying to um, just understand what the market is, is requiring of them for them to help them achieve their goals, not necessarily the ones that we might have for an organization. Um, I don't know if that speaks to the question, but. Well, I think it goes back to, you know, how important that understanding the assets and, and understanding what the interests are, not just of your nonprofit or your funders or whatever, but what's really going to be best for that grower um, and what really makes sense for their business. Um, so for us in New Mexico, um, there's a few sort of tools in our toolbox that we've worked pretty excitedly around over the last year or two um, with other agency partners, our nonprofit partners, our Tart in the Bag, Cooperative Extension and others. Um, that really builds off that, that challenge that we have here and it sounds like in Kentucky as well and other states of this, this sort of market requirement around gap and third party audits not driving the school system or institutional purchases at this time. Um, and thus a lot of our farmers not being gap or third party audit certified and then there being this sort of uh, perceived barrier that exists between them where one side 
thinks the other thinks that those requirements are in place about the other right and so <laughs> I would just, um, and something, you know, weakness in our system that we're actively addressing is, and it's a, it's a really uh, profound part of our, our for, sort of farm to institutional ecosystem here is that the relationships in our state are very, very strong and all of the work has existed between and among individual people or individual organizations for decades. And so we're at this point of like, just putting it all out in the open so that no matter who you are or what like family you're from or what clique you're in, you have access to the same information in any language that you need it um, on all of the websites. All the messaging is the same, so that there's just a, a very clear and even playing ground um, for anybody who wants to has, wants to touch point into our farm to our New Mexico grown farm to everything our farm to institutional system. Um, so the first thing that we've worked pretty um, actively on is this idea of an approved supplier program, and so that's building off again this this reality that most of our our farmers are not um, third party audited. Um, so we worked with other, you know, partners who have a lot of respect in the in the agricultural space. So again, Department of Ag, Cooperative Extension, our Farmers Marketing Association, La Montanita, and others, um, to basically develop an alternate pathway for farmers who are not GAP or third party certified. And it's a state vetted program. We manage it out of PED, but it also feeds into, as I mentioned, the senior centers and our early care sites. Um, so we've provided a free to low cost touch point for any farmer, again, no matter their language spoken, which is something I'll get to in a second, but um, to have, again, an alternate pathway that doesn't require a thousand dollar plus every time an auditor comes to your property. So we are honoring at one side that many of our small scale growers are growing food safely and are very aware of the realities of their of the system that they're in, but also knowing that as a state program that's using state money working with Food service directors who are serving all of the most vulnerable populations we needed to kind of cover our tracks a little bit and also again i'm a very i'm like obsessed with systems i'm probably using that word like a thousand times already but again providing a very clear like this is a journey from a to z for any grower to sell into the schools and other institutions that it's not a mystery um so that that program has you know food safety plan component it also has a required training component and then we sort of track it on the back end um, through our agency partnerships um, to make sure that you know we have an approved supplier list for any institution that wants to purchase New Mexico grown produce using state funding, and that's been a very profound, exciting development that um, we believe has a lot of. We're in a, our pilot year right now, and so we'll officially roll this out next year. But a lot of potential to again diversify and increase the types of products coming into our schools and other institutions, but also the types of vendors. Um, so with that comes the requirement, right? So if we're setting a requirement, a, a streamlined vendor sort of requirement across the state. So again, it's the approved supplier program, but it's also we're standardizing specs, we're standardizing timeline, we're standardizing, you know, suggestions around when you should be doing production planning. All of that looks is pretty uniform um, moving forward now across all of our 58 grantees. So um, so any school district currently that's um, using state funds is, is considered a grantee. Um, in that, as a state agency, we have to make sure that we're providing resources in not only Spanish, but also Navajo and potentially other languages that are not English. And so that creates a, um, a challenge, but it also is just a reality if we're really truly doing equity work and really truly believe in um, an equitable food system that serves everybody's needs equally. Um, and again, you know, considering that schools, senior centers, and, all, and, and our early care are different touch points with different capacities and different quantity that we, again, are providing a menu of options for different types of vendors to access the system. Um, the other piece is that um, we always do, we do annual production planning meetings with all of our growers and our buyers. That's, again, the sort of uniform program that provides us easy access to anybody who's selling to our schools and other institutions. So we do that meeting annually in multiple languages and we do production planning and networking. Um, this year will have to be virtual, unfortunately. Um, we also are advised by a network of nonprofits and farmers, mostly of color, who are providing constant feedback on the system. So meeting monthly and, and, and literally getting constant like in real time feedback and guidance from our partners on what the, the system that we're building, because it doesn't exist right, uh, what that should look like because it impacts more than just our agency, it impacts the whole state. And so that's been a key strategy of ours this year and will and will remain moving forward. Um, and then I think the last piece is the idea that the New Mexico Grown Program, while it's an agency-led initiative, is really owned by farmers and the buyers, right? And so really trying to figure out how to address the sort of gap or this perceived hierarchy between agencies and the people on the ground doing like the actual everyday work. Um, and for us, 
that's you know looking at how we message the program, but it's also what we're doing with our data. So we we collect a ton of data. We know average price points. We know how we know which products are most popular. We know trends per season. All this data, right, that we're holding internally at the agency. That's and knowledge is power, right? And so trying to figure out how to externally interface that information so that again, any partner, whether you're a nonprofit, other agency, farmer, buyer, family member, student, teacher, you have access and, and understand kind of where you can get a pulse on where we're at regionally and statewide in terms of the, the trends and sort of the vision and the future of our of our farm to New Mexico grown farm to institution system. So I think that's the last piece. And then you know with that, I think the skills are like the attributes that one needs to be able to do this work. And it's already been mentioned by my colleagues is you know this idea of experience, trust and relationships. Like we would not have been able to do the work, the really exciting innovative work that we're doing in New Mexico without decades of relationships that allows an agency to even be in this space kind of helping lead strategy. I mean, that's, that's really built off of a two-way relationship that's really based on trust. And so that's the, the last thing that I wanna mention. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Kendall. I was thinking about, as you were describing the tools that you use, thinking about some of those sort of structural barriers that are in place that make it difficult, even if, right, you do have the the buyer and the seller in the room together, that there are still lots of messy things that can happen in between. And thinking about you all sort of trying to take down each of those barriers individually with food safety, with, you know, knowledge, with, uh, you know, scale and, and appropriate marketing for each individual grower. So yeah, as you were talking about systems, thinking about what it is in the system that makes that uh, connection so difficult. Yeah, can I make one more? Could you just, so I think the, the and I'll keep this really quick. I mean, the previous response to this uniform, and I, I'm not a big uniform prescriptive person, but in this situation, it's required. The response prior to us developing this infrastructure that I just mentioned was like, you know, a farmer would say like, how do I sell to schools or a nonprofit or another, another partner? And you'd say, well, it depends on the district, right? That doesn't, that doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't help us move forward or move the needle or like equitably build the, the field, right? That's just, that's again, dependent on relationships and the capacity of those specific districts to be able to follow through on this vision of a more equitable, more, more profound system, the farm to school system that they may not see or believe in. And so it's kind of, a, it's the prerogative of the agency and partners to really push and lead that. So um, thank you, Ellie, for reminding me to say that. Yeah, sure. Um, Alita and Olivia, anything else on sort of tools in the tool belt or skills that you all bring to the table to help make this happen? You know, I would say on a couple of tools that I think have been very helpful, and it builds off of that systems comment that, that Kendall made, which I love. Um, you know, I think one thing that we do with everyone that we interact with is we do track them and then we do um, regular follow-ups as we learn of their needs and we make sure that if we've helped them connect up with a resource provider say maybe it is a gap audit maybe it is a marketing grant maybe it is we're circling back with them to make sure that they got the help they needed and I think that's been really helpful from our perspective and we've been doing that for years um, before we took on this the value chain work more intentionally I think what that adds, though, to the value chain work is that we're constantly circling back with people after we have worked with them on a market um, on a market question or helping them connect up with a buyer so that we know what whether it worked out or not. And um, the classic example with Olivia is there was a new buyer in the in the marketplace that was really trying to develop um, a local food marketplace. And one of the big questions was we need to make sure people are getting paid because that is a real challenge with new businesses, new buyers, is making sure that they, they meet their, um, the payment uh, commitments that they've made. And so by following up all the time, you know, and really creating a system by which we do that follow-up, it's really helped us make sure that, that, that um, people are not getting left behind, that, that we're not losing people in the system. You know, they always have us to turn to and they know we're gonna touch base with them. The other piece I would mention is because we run, we run a separate program that helps um, folks understand what money is out there funding wise for different needs. And so the great thing is, you know, if Olivia finds a producer that has a particular need, say for, again, gap audit, or they need organic transition work, or they need whatever, then we probably can help them locate any financial resources and additional technical assistance resources just because we built that up as part of our capacity as well. 
So just a quick follow up question um, from Hallie. Hi, Hallie. Um, is what like specific tool? Is there a big spreadsheet or how do you keep track? How do you what are, are these emails, text messages? Let's get technical. So uh, yeah, Olivia is going to shoot me. And you know, <laughs> this is one of those where if I start going off on this, you guys are going to have to mute me real fast because it's <laughs> like my passion. Um, and we we actually we use a database for everyone that walks in our proverbial doors. And um, so we're, we're tracking people in a database and um, we have next action dates, next actions, what the person's, um, who the person's primary contact is. And this is ingrained in our K-card system and has been for a number of years now. And that we've seen, it's tremendous what difference it makes because you don't lose people. And, and you do create a mechanism by which they develop a relationship with you that then you can actually see their business grow over time and see the needs of that business change over time. Because even if we don't hear from you, we're just going to touch base on a quarterly basis, just say, you know, how, how's it going? How's the market going? You know? And so, so we use a SharePoint list. Um, that, that was our tool. We used to use an access database that's progressed. Again, I won't go off on my wonkiness with it because I do love this, but feel free to contact us on offline because this is something that I just heart. So, yeah. And to uh, add to that, yeah, just quickly. Um, so we do have the database, but the database would be no good if we didn't print out weekly reminders of, hey, your next action is due for this person this week. So we kind of have a homework list every week or, you know, we all try to update it to make sure it's updated before a monthly staff meeting or something like that. So that is crucial that we have that public list where everyone's next action for every client is a part of our staff meetings. So that's obviously a really critical part of y'all sort of approach is making sure that you're really closing the loop, that you're really following up with people. And I think, you know, as we've been having this conversation, I've been thinking a lot about trust and credibility and reputation and how important that is. And it seems like for y'all that, you know, part of that, that trust is that continual follow-up that you guys are always going to be there and you're always going to be checking back in. Um, and, you know, Kendall, you talked a little bit about credibility by using extension, by using the State Department of Ag and, and sort of using those other known entities to help increase, um, you know, people's trust in, in y'all and your work. So um, what are some other ways you establish credibility? How do you get, um, you know, how do you build that trust? How do you build those relationships that are so key? Yeah, I think so. Just to like really like echo that point. Um, so for us, so if I'm trying, so when we, and just to mention, so our sort of system for follow-up, we use a back-end quality management system that's managed by a nonprofit partner and then our other sort of core partners that are, are all sort of rallied around this idea of an approved supplier program. I do wanna note that it's all manual right now and we're moving towards a virtual platform that will house all of the things that I mentioned into one beautiful high-tech space. Um, so that, you know, if I'm a farmer, I can go and I can access the approved supplier program, track my progress, track where I am in the QMS, track data from other, like I could do that all in one place. So we are dreaming about that right now. Um, cause the manual and, and ladies, you can speak to that, like the, the manual and sort of the human, the human aspect of all this takes time. It takes a lot of capacity, um, to do constant follow-up, especially with, I don't, can't speak to your growers, but our farmers who aren't all tech savvy don't necessarily respond to emails. So it's a lot of calls. Um, texts. I get texts all day on my personal phone, even though I have a work cell phone. So, you know, it, it's layers and layers and layers of um, strategies to make sure that everybody's um, supported. Um, so I think uh, for us, it's really working with aligned partners who have, who may or may not have more trust with the people that we're trying to, we're trying to hit. So for me to follow up with a farmer who may not know me and sees my state address, email address, may not respond to me the same way that they will to our colleagues at the New Mexico Food and Ag Policy Council or our food hub partners. Um, and so just kind of honoring that, um, we kind of have, especially agency folks have to be able to move through these spaces pretty seamlessly. So you need to be able to move through the farmer sort of on the ground side of things and also move through agency leadership, um, executive branch, and our nonprofit partners in the same way and that they're all are as equally, they all are important, right? And then hold the same level of importance. And I think for me and my work, that's what I think has given my, our program the most credibility is that there's this constant interface with farmers specifically and our buyers and the rest of the folks in the, in the value chain um, 
to make sure that they understand that, especially as we develop this new system that I keep referring to, um, it's not a top-down approach, that it was built in and with community-based partners, with our farmers, with constant feedback, and that there's constant opportunity for guidance and sort of pushback from our many partners, specifically looking at our farmers. So um, I think as a, as a governmental entity, really having that space for open dialogue at all times and being um, very clear about who's advising the development of the program you're trying to develop and who's not and being, um, yeah, just very, very conscious of that, the way it looks externally, internally, and the way it drives strategy. So, um, and then also, you know, making sure that we're working on multiple levels at all times. So not just focusing on buyers, also focusing on, you know, superintendents, also looking at farmers and our food hubs and our policymakers and sort of up and down the, this, this theoretical um, hierarchy that drives so much of our work. Other thoughts on, on establishing credibility? It sounds like really seeking a lot of feedback and then being honest about using that feedback when you move forward feels um, really great for est establishing that trust and credibility. Um, yeah, I can speak to it from KCARD's perspective. So, I mean, I think I think people have gotten the picture that KCARD's been around for a while and that we had trust built before this very focused uh, value chain, you know, coordination. Um, but to just add on to that, um, we work really closely, I think I've mentioned with our Department of Ag, but um, also with, you know, city governments who have local food coordinators or, you know, uh, Farm Bureau and like kind of major ag key players in the state of Kentucky, which might look different in other states, but um, we recognize that and we, we try to have close working relationships and open relationships with all of them, um, which works to, I think everyone's advantage, our, our advantage and the, the people that we're trying to serve. So um, I've mentioned the consistent outreach and follow-up already, but um, one thing I wanted to point out, and, and Alita's mentioned this, that we will never advise, you know, a, for a farmer to make a bad business move, and especially in the, the um, connecting to a buyer scene. Um, and so she mentioned, you know, I kind of vetted a new buyer on the on the market to say or reached out to one of my producers and said hey are you getting paid yes okay good now I feel good about <laughs> now I feel good about recommending this you know just let me know if anything and, and I didn't have any reason to not suspect that this guy was going to pay his bills it's just that there's been some examples of you know other things that have happened in the state where um, it doesn't happen so we're just trying to protect our relationships on on both ends and then on the other hand, like I'm never gonna recommend to a buyer, a producer who's not at the quality or the scale or the consistency that that buyer needs. So likewise, trying to build trust with that buyer. Um, I do try to kind of vet, vet some producers to some extent before, you know, pitching them to Kroger or something like that. I mean, that doesn't happen every day, but, um, that's kind of an example. Um, I think it can be, Alita and I were talking about this, especially tempting if you're working um, towards some metrics, if you are grant funded to recommend something that's gonna look good or to get an article written, um, but we never ever wanna sacrifice our reputation for just a one-off deal. We wanna try to build uh, lasting local food partnerships and buying relationships that are gonna be good both for the buyer and for the producer. Um, and one other thing I wanted to mention is that um, I really try to do my homework before I reach out to a new buyer or a new producer or distributor or co-packer. And that can mean a lot of different things. It can be as simple as looking at that person's website and learning a little bit about them. Or it can be trying to dig into the nitty gritty details like um, or colorful situations maybe that have happened in the past and try to learn a little bit about what went on there so that I'm just a little bit informed before I walk into a situation and I ask a buyer to get interested in local or I ask a producer to pursue a certain, or I ask them if they'd be interested in pursuing a certain market channel. I just wanna know as much as I can about the background. Um, so yeah, but um, not, you know, there's a history with this, I mean, local food or the, the value chain coordination, it's all got, colorful history with, you know, it's not, even though it's somewhat new, my position, it's not new in the state. Um, 
and but not letting like bad deals impact um my willingness to to kind of give something the benefit of the doubt that it'll work out um Alita and I were talking about how Kentucky agriculture and the opportunities here is changing. Um, it feels like very quickly. We were traditionally, you know, a tobacco based economy. And because of that, um, in the last 20 years, we've had to change really quickly and be open to changing really quickly. And so um, we always have to be looking out for, uh, you know, what's next, I guess. Yeah, it sounds like a balancing act between, you know, knowing the background and understanding um, the history, but but also being optimistic and and being creative too. Um, interesting. Well, thank you all for that. Um, you all have talked a little bit about who some of your friends and allies are, but I'm wondering if there are any folks that that are really critical to your success that you haven't mentioned, and also if there are other sort of folks in value chain coordination roles and what a relationship looks like between multiple people that are kind of trying to do this value chain coordination work at the same time. I know, you know, in Kentucky and New Mexico that there's a, a pretty robust value chain coordination like network. Um, I can go first. I just one example that I, I'm glad you brought this up. I thought about it is um, I work very closely, especially with one other uh, value chain coordinator. She's um, employed by a, by a city government and that looks like touching base every week on phone calls. We and we are together pursuing um, some opportunity. Kind of what I said earlier: those long change uh, or those really hard goals that aren't quick wins. I've decided to try to approach that with her. Um, us using our main hours together to target um, a bigger audience or to you know, have a better proposal um, or project going forward. So, I mean, I touch base with her weekly. I have uh, monthly calls with the value chain coordinator at the Department of Ag. Um, so just constantly staying in contact with them. Um, Alita, can you think of any other? Key Those partners? are the most important relationships that we have. We do try to be very open tent and very transparent. And so we really try to, to, you know, let people know what we're doing and be very open about it. Uh, I would say one thing that helps us with the, the partners that we have is many of those, those entities sit on our board. They have a board meet with us. So in some ways that, and as many of y'all know, working with nonprofits, if you do have a board relationship, that can be very helpful then to ensuring that you have that kind of cooperation and that openness with that organization. And so I think that's been beneficial on our end is that, again, we had those relationships for a while. So it's natural that we would progress into a new area. And then they're very in tune with what KCARD's doing because they're sitting on our governing board. And I think for us, um, so we have value chain coordinators that are nonprofit or housed in nonprofits. And then we have our actual food hubs and aggregators that are also operating as sort of value chain coordinators for their yeah. regions. Um, we meet regularly um, because we are, so um, PED, which is our agency, the Farmers Marketing Association, all the entities I already mentioned and our food hubs all meet regularly around this, our QMS and our approved supplier program. So somebody asked the question, I gave a very long winded response. Um, about like who owns it. And so that, that leadership team is who like really owns and drives um, the work around the approved supplier program and then the bigger picture coordination um, among food hubs and our, our value chain coordinators. So, um, and then, you know, I'm sort of, I'm like a pseudo value chain coordinator. I see myself as, as part of that role, except that I am not involved in transactions, right? In the buying or the, or the selling, but sort of the sort of a backbone behind the scenes value chain coordinator in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to think about you know, the role of the, of the folks in, you have to have strong relationships and strong connection to the folks in the supply chain and the folks that are kind of doing that systems support work um, and, and seeing both of that both of those activities as value chain coordination, you can do it from within a food hub or a processor, um, or there's also a lot of need for some of that, that coordination work from state government, nonprofits, um, you know, academia as well. So my last question, and then we have a lot of good ones in the chat as well, is how do y'all measure your success? I know, um, you know, KCARD mentioned that y'all are a nonprofit and you have to report, but you don't want to let metrics get in the way of 
doing good work. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you do measure success and and how you you know track the impact that y'all are having. Olivia, you want me to lead off on the metrics one? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so great. we you know we track uh, the usual metrics that are required by every federal grant program, jobs right? Number of entities created, number of entities assisted. Um, so we do track those. Um, you know, I could give my opinion about all of those, but it wouldn't be pleasant. So I, I think the key, and, and I think the, the point is we don't track just any one metric, and we, we track a lot of different ones that provide a complete picture. So for instance, one metric that we have historically tracked has been business success rate. So that everyone who is um, in our database, um, we go through, in fact, January, so it's time, uh, we go through and on an annual basis, we track whether they are still in business and we report that. And it's consistently above 80% of ones who've launched that we've worked with are still in business. That's a great number. That's a great metric that we can use. But I always make the point of this is not the only metric we're looking at because then we wouldn't work with anyone who... Um, didn't stand a good chance of success and that's not who we are. So we're also gonna track how many people we help and how many new people we help. So, you know, I think the key on metrics is really determining um, what it is that you, is going to be in line with your mission and what it is you're going to need to report to your governing bodies or your funders. And then making sure that the complete picture is what you consider as an organization because that's what's gonna help you stay true to your, um, you know, get back to your true north, which is what are we here for? You know, who are we trying to help? What are we trying to do here? And so that that way one metric doesn't skew you and skew your, your activities because it's gonna be a perverse incentive. Like Olivia mentioned, if we were just about the big win, that's the press release, that's really gonna create a bad incentive for us not to do the work that we really need to do that's that long, you know, building in that systems work that, that really takes a lot of time, it may not pay off even in the grant period, but it's important work for Kentucky and for Kentucky farmers. So to me, I think, it, you know, I've mentioned some of the metrics that we track, but I also would say that the idea is look at the big picture and make sure that the big picture is in line with where you as an organization are and what your mission is. And that can keep you from going too far astray to just do a metric just because, gosh darn it, the funder really wants that metric. I think that's a real tension that all nonprofits face. Um, Kendall, in a in a state government position, how do you measure your success? What does that look like? So we track um, transactional data. So Danielle asked me a question, a private question. Um, so we track total you know, the basic stuff that you'd expect: total spend. You know how much um, of the how much of an SFA's Produce budget is going to local, and so we know of our grantees, which is which our grantees are serving more than half the students across the state. That on average they're spending at least fifteen percent of their produce budget on local items, and so we have these benchmarks that are very. I mean, they're important, right? They're good to track, and we should know how much total spend is and things like that. But as we sort of like reorient the system to better serve, again, all the all the reasons I already mentioned, I don't need to go back into that. But um, those transactional data points are not really all that helpful. So. Um, and I have to say, we still have a lot of area of growth here, um, but like for us, we want to see again, you know, the diversity of vendors increase. So with that comes tracking the demographics of our vendors, which currently we're not tracking very, very closely. Um, we need to be able to track stable buying relationships over time so that a school district or a senior center is purchasing from an increasing amount of vendors over, over, over the years, right? So we, we want to track that. Um, we need to be tracking the increase in like small acreage producers growing to our institutions. We need to be tracking the sort of this, the relationships between and among the vendors and across our community of practice. And we need to be tracking our schools and our institutions moving up the ladder of innovation. Um, and that is to, like in development now, we need to have a ladder of, of innovation, right? We need to have a sort of example of tiered touch points for districts and institutions that are trying to improve um, and then track our institutions over time to make sure that we're moving them in the right direction. So those are some of the things um, we're thinking about and then internally for our own measurement of success, making sure that all the resources that I mentioned, we have multilingual resources to as any type of a vendor that wants to sell to our system, 
um, that a that a early childhood like a preschool that serves 10 kids in super rural New Mexico has the same opportunity to buy local as a urban school district, right? So those are those are the types of things that we're reorienting our system towards that aren't super established yet. So I want to be honest about that, but just you know, really moving beyond tracking dollars spent because that's not going to fully express where we're trying to go. And to use um, what my colleagues have mentioned earlier, like the North Star, like what is our North Star, and then making sure that our metrics are really um, rallying around that North Star. Thank you all so much for that commentary. I know with some of this value chain coordination work, particularly for those of you that aren't in the supply chain, that sometimes those economic measures are really not a great indicator of how well you're actually doing. And, you know, Alita, you mentioned that sometimes the grant period is not even close to long enough to see some of the benefit of what you're doing. So I think, you know, figuring out ways to, to still show success and show the impact that you're making that are honest and both, you know, relevant to your funders is a real tough not to crack. So um, thanks for some guidance on that. Uh, we have a couple great questions in the chat box here. So I'm going to I'm going to move towards some of those and feel free to keep them coming folks in the audience. Um, as we move on here. So one question is about technology. You know, Kendall, I know you mentioned moving into a, a from an analog to a digital system. So wondering about the key role for technology that you're using right now or that you're seeing um, in the future. Um, yeah, I can elaborate a little bit. So we are definitely in, in analog mode right now. And so I, so the example I shared earlier about, you know, we know average price point, we know minimum maximum price point per every product that's been sold to schools over the last school year. Um, I hate to even make this public, but that was all extracted manually. <laughs> so, so those are the types of things that were like this, it doesn't, is it worth the human capital that has to go into manually sort of aggregating and pulling out data and then putting it into a, a, a sort of usable um, document for our farmers and our partners. Yes, but um, we're in 2021 now, right? So, um, but finding funding for that technology is huge. Even for a state agency, we have to sell the idea to leadership that investing in a platform and technology hub for this idea of New Mexico Grown is something that we haven't, um, that's sort of somebody asked in the, in the chat, like that will be the, the ask for our state legislature to consider over the next few years to accompany the money that's going straight to our districts, senior centers and early career sites. And so um, that's the future. I spoke with uh, colleagues from Virginia a few months ago who were also embarking on this idea of data collecting and they were also discussing doing it manually. And so that's my biggest advice for people is to really figure out funding and the capacity you need to just make this um, high tech because it, it's really challenging to have to extract data from um, you know a million dollars worth of purchases and then figure out how to put that in a usable form for our partners. So um, yeah, platform, virtual technology hub. I'm not, a, I'm not a technology person, so I can't speak to any more details, but something um, that's useful for all of our partners that holds real-time data that anybody can access at all times is, the, is sort of the next year, year to two for our program. Excellent. Any Kentucky thoughts on technology? We heart technology, but <laughs> I'm not sure we use it to the best. Um, you know, we're still learning. Let's put it this way. You know, we've gotten, we get our information into our system so that anyone working for KCARD can access that system and can update it. And so that we always know where that business is at uh, with regards to our work with them. And that's, that's really important. That was like job one. Um, what we, Olivia and I have talked a lot about with our current work um, and with other projects as well is what information we can share with partners and how we share that information with our partners so that, you know, similar to what Kendall was talking about, I think is that, you know, making sure that your other partners that have the same goals of you are able to access information that they need when they need it. Mm -hmm. But from our point of view, we really want to make sure that we're not going to be putting uh, businesses in a spot where they've got information that they don't want other people to know. And so that's the tension. And I think that's something we're still tr trying to figure out how to use technology to make sure that we can share information with our partners so that we can all do our jobs better, but also protect that producer information. Can I have one more thing to something we sure. think a lot about? I mean, there's this push to, to make all ordering virtual and it's of other states are already doing this. I, I don't mean to offend you, but um, it, 
in our state we're really still protecting this the like that like analog right the old school relationship between the buyer and and the grower right and so um that tension around you know external partners really wanting everything to be virtual you do all the ordering online you can see in real time production capacity of a food hub or a farm like all of those things are great and i think we're slowly that that is part of the idea of this online platform that has all that information but as an option for people never to force all of our partners including our growers into this high tech sort of world that may or may not fit their needs and realities that's something also in a place where we're a super rural state um you know, internet is not stable everywhere. And so really remembering that a lot of our folks and our partners are in places where they aren't able to access high tech resources like some of us can every day. And so that tension too, I just wanted to kind of throw out there. Yeah, yeah, I can just add a quick thing to that. Um, I think I, I thought of this earlier in the call, but um, Kendall was saying how her phone is, is ringing all the time or her personal numbers ringing. And um, I was thinking about um, some of, we have some really great, um, growers for the, the local food scene in Kentucky that um, are Amish or are plain. And so they do not have tech access like we do. And um, I'm pre frequently, I, but this, this week I was on a Zoom call and I totally understood that the person I was with, they're like, hold on, I'm getting a call from my Amish grower. I need to pause our call so I can talk to them, you know, so that, and I have worked with um, a few growers like that to try, try to help them connect with buyers. And it just means, you know, me, calling at between 3 30 and 4 o'clock when they're going to be at the, the you know the public telephone so we try to um use our phone technology which is appropriate for certain growers you know to still try to help them access those new markets and um, it's really amazing what they can do or through fax machines and stuff so yeah so i think like trying to embrace the what you can do with technology but also understanding um, that that can like cut you off from some folks. So a balance of you all using it to the best of your ability, but not um, forgetting about people that that aren't don't have access to internet or aren't as comfortable um, with technology. So uh, another question here, and this is maybe going to get a little technical. Um, Kendall, you mentioned a QMS, and when I think of a QMS, I definitely think of like group gap food safety. But it seems like the one that y'all are using is doing a little more than that. So could you talk about it? But talk about it maybe like I'm in second grade. <laughs> I'm going to call on my close colleague Steve Warshire to help me with that if he's available. Sure. Steve, are you there? Can you give us the uh, one on one? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And there's no echo? No, it's nope. good. Okay, cool. I'll, even, I'll put the video on. Um, okay. So yeah, what, what, the, the, what happened for us in New Mexico was that we could not get farmers all the way to Gap, like zero to 60 in a bazillion, you know, seconds or negative a bazillion seconds. And we had to get folks food safety savvy, and we had to come up with a way to demonstrate their efficacy as food safety practitioners. So we, we, and so we were doing good trainings, but we didn't have them gathered together into a systemic, systematic form. And so we basically created a quality management system to track and report and document pre-gap food safety. As we did that, we saw all, all these other needs that Kendall is describing, such as specifications and quality and stuff like that, which we, which we know that the quality management system can also address. So we started with the food safety uh, trail, turning it into a dirt road, getting it up to a one lane paved road so that eventually we can get them on the gap superhighway. Um, but along the way, we also know all these fantastic and important, you know, uh, mile markers and uh, what do you call vistas and viewpoints, and those get off into other aspects of supply chain management. So the QMS is designed first to connect to the gap world when it's needed, but then to document the activities that the farms are going through to become competent food safety practitioners. Um, and also to design these sort of connecting nodes for these other buyer needs. Um, and what's been so inspiring to me to see this evolution of this quality management system, and we've got our national food safety guru, Phil Britton, as our guide. Um, and what Phil has done is he's brought together the different interest groups, the different stakeholders in the system. You know, the, and, and so they talk to each other about what they need from the QMS. 
how to participate in it. And so the quality management system becomes essentially a backbone for the network, for the different interest groups and stakeholders in it and what they need from each other. And it did grow around food safety, but it grew around this absolute realization that it's not either your gap or you're not gap and therefore your food safe or you're not food safe. Mm -hmm. It grew out of this realization that folks can do the right thing and not be GAP certifiable. Kendall, how'd I do? Pass it back to you, go back. On. Beautiful, thank you, I, I, great. Yeah, I would have watched that, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I would just like to note that um, my colleague Elizabeth Atwell just mentioned in the chat that Wallace Center did a lot of work um, with USDA to create a guide about developing quality management systems, which are a really great tool for food safety, but also have um, lots of other uh, functions that you can kind of hang on top of that as well. So keep an eye out for that. It should be released uh, shortly. I'm not going to make any promises that I can't keep. <laughs> um, so kind of coming back to this question about tracking and, and getting a little more specific about it um, is how do you track and, and measure the impact of relationships? I mean, we, you know, I think have spent so much time talking about credibility and trust and knowing the right people and making the right connections, but have you all come up with any hacks for, for how you track the impact of, of relationships? It's a tough one. No. But as I mentioned, that's something that we we are rec we recognize here that needs to be tracked. But do not have I don't have a good response to that question. That's a yeah. specific question. How about my colleagues in Kentucky? You know, it's a great question. Um, and actually, um, we were awarded a regional food system partnership grant this past year. So it's a question on my mind right now. Um, <laughs> because that really is about this whole collaboration and what we're doing and how do you track it? I mean, I think some of the surrogate measures that you could use, all of them are imperfect. You know, um, you can use, you know, dollars secured for partnerships, right? Because typically you are going to be seeking funding or there's going to be um, relationships established that result in a lending relationship or a grant relationship, mm -hmm. right? So you can track funding as one element, funding that involves other collaborative um, pieces. It's a really not a great metric, right? But I'm trying to think of other surrogates um, that could be used. I think one of the things that we're really experimenting with and something that is on my radar screen for this year is really tracking how we communicate with our partners and um, are there more efficient ways to communicate that achieve better goals than the Zoom call, the, the Brady Bunch Zoom call, where we all go around and talk about our partnerships and, and that kind of thing. And that's something Olivia and I've talked a lot about and we've talked about otherwise on staff, which is, you know, are there other communication tools that we could be using that also could be used as a tracker? Because if you have partners updating hey, here's what we're doing that might be helpful to the group. Hey, here's what, you know, that might be a way is to track what kind of input you get from your partners in mm -hmm. such a communication tool. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's rough. Yeah, yeah, I think it's sort of one of the, one of the trickiest parts of this work because it feels like we all know inherently that these things are really important, but it's really hard to, to pin down or like, you know, get hard evidence for that. Um, so work continues. <laughs> So um, one thing on that, this might not be exactly what you're asking, but um, before my role as a local food coordinator for KCARD, I had um, the KCARD phone with like everybody knew who wanted to call us. Um, I answered the phone. And I feel like one of the most valuable things I offered in that position was um, to be able to knowledgeably send someone where they should go or get them the exact information that they need that honestly like like this ties back to partnerships because um k card staff or k card employees have some level baseline of okay what's available through nrcs equip um specifically what's worked here what's available through um you know we have some smaller like small scale grants or who do they need to talk to at UK to get the food label? Um, who do they need to talk to to get um, organic certified? And for a producer to be able to like, it's almost impossible to just hop online and figure that out in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Or so 
to me, one of the measures of like successful relationships or par partners working well together is how quickly I can get a farmer like a good answer um, on the phone or like can copy them on an email to, to my partner who I work with at the Department of Ag who has the connections with a buyer that I'm not even worrying about because he's got the connections there and I can just copy them and he picks it up and says he runs with it, you know, or yeah. um, so just being able to like get producers what they need with good answers, um, I think can be a measure of working well together. Excellent. Um, so we have a few minutes left here and I, uh, I think we might've run through a lot of the good questions in the chat, but opening up for the panelists to ask e each other any questions, if anything um, came up that you wanted to ask each other and then we'll wrap it up. Well, I'm really intrigued by New Mexico's programs and I'm gonna be following up on that because I think there's some lessons we could be pulling into Kentucky's um, programs, definitely. So I'll be following up. That's part of our idea here. Um, a question in a chat, uh, which um, is if the panelists would be willing to share their contact information so folks can reach out to them again with any questions. I know that uh, that's really valuable. Wonderful. Um, let's see, I don't have a specific question, but yeah, the feeling is mutual. So um, yeah, I think I was just talking to somebody in Arizona in the chat, it's just the, the that's the whole purpose of these communities of practice, right? Like that's, we're all doing incredible work that may or may not work in the context of another state, but why not cross pollinate and figure out what's, you know, what's working and what the model is and, you know, rip, rip off and duplicate as, as needed. And so, um, yeah, I don't have a specific question, but it's been an honor to share this virtual space with, with you ladies this morning. Thank you or afternoon rather. <laughs> Well, wonderful. Um, that is our dream come true hosting these calls is that, you know, it begins to just cross pollinate and, and help people be more effective at their jobs. That's really our hope here. Um, so with that, I'm going to put out a really quick poll that speaking of metrics is going to help us um, track our impact for some of our federal funders. Uh, so if you could take a second to answer these questions really quickly, that would be very helpful to Wallace Center. Um, and then the last thing is that we have lots of exciting programming going on right now. Um, the, the most pertinent of which is this accelerator that's meant to help folks working with institutions um, improve their practices and get those institutions to come to the table and, and make some investments in their work. Um, so we're launching this accelerator program. The, um, the application closes February 1st and that can be found Thank you through the link in the chat that Elizabeth just put in. Um, and again, I really appreciate everyone's time and attention, particularly when our lives are so crazy and chaotic and I learned a ton. So, so much um, gratitude to our excellent presenters today and for those of you who were able to join us. So thank you all very much and please stay safe. Bye.